can see from the PowerPoint. Today we are going to discuss a topic that I think is very applicable to every single one of us. Throughout all of our lives, there is a part of us that is constantly in pursuit of happiness. I want to be happy. I want to be fulfilled. I want to live a life where I'm not filled with sadness. I feel like, you know, uh, I, I just want to reach a point in which things are good. Does this sound familiar to us? And the question is, is today my hope is, is to share with you guys a little bit of a psycholo- psychology-based approach and the scientific approach to happiness and how researchers have spent so many years trying to understand what is the key to happiness. And I'm going to tell you, what they've come up with is not something new. It's not something that is far from what we know for thousands of years in the tradition of the church. The problem is, in the modern context, what they do is they take ideas that they think are new and innovative as if it's their own. For example, in the medical world now, most physicians are talking about intermittent fasting and the benefits of intermittent fasting and how it gives you a clearer mind, it helps you lose weight. Guess what, guys? We've been intermittent fasting for thousands of years. (laughs) Nothing new. Meditation. There's now meditation and mindfulness is something that is new in the context of the world of psychology, and mindfulness is a very effective way for people to learn how to to balance and to, uh, to battle negative thoughts. Guess what? We have the prayer of the heart that has been in the tradition of the church, again, for thousands of years in the desert. The Jesus prayer, my Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Finding the inner presence of God finding a place where you're not distracted by the things that are going on in your mind and finding the Lord within. And I could give you example after example after example of things that the modern world thinks is new and innovative. And if only we knew who we were and we knew what the church and the tradition of Christianity has taught us, we would have a better grasp of how to live life fully and abundantly. Christ said, I have come that they may give them life and they may live it more abundantly. So I guess my question to you is what is happiness? Is there like a metric for it? Is it a destination? And how do I find it? How do you define happiness? Let me give you, let's do some class participation. How do you define happiness? What do you guys think? Sorry, satisfaction, okay. What else? Sorry? Sorry? Chocolate. Chocolate is happiness. I, I, I totally agree. I totally agree. Actually, chocolate ice cream with brownies? <laughs> Double chocolate. That's, that's real happiness. Also, a bit of gluttony in there when you overeat and eat the whole pint. I promise I wasn't going to eat that whole pint, but I found it was all finished. Peacefulness. Peacefulness. Okay. Something... Something external, okay? Something that is, gives you maybe a temporary moment of, of, of happiness. Okay, okay. I'm going to give you modern psychology's definition of a happy person. Research in the field of positive psychology. By the way, positive psychology is like a, a, an emerging field in the world. And there is this professor by the name of Sonia Lambersky. She works, she's at Harvard University. And she wrote a book called Happiness. It's a fascinating book. I, read, I, I, I really enjoyed reading it because it goes into all this data and details on what makes people happy. So it's defined. Research in the field of positive psychology and happiness often define a happy person as someone who experiences two components in life. First, it's frequent positive emotions such as joy, interest, and pride, and infrequent, though not absent, negative emotions such as sadness, anxiety, anger, And second, having a sense of satisfaction in your life. So they define it, which it it sort of seems like it makes sense, right? Like there is positive emotion, right, which are joy, interest, pride. And then there are these negative emotions, which are sadness, anxiety, and anger. And then you've become happy through being satisfied in the midst of both those things. So whether it's positive or negative, I learn to be satisfied regardless of where I am. The question is, 
what do we find are things that make us happy? Is it a relationship? Is it more flexibility at work? Is it a new job that provides you more for your family? Is it an extra bedroom? A two-bedroom two, two house, my, people are, my family's breathing all over me, I need space. If I get away from my family, I'll have a little bit more space and I'll be happier. Is it a more attentive spouse? Is it a baby? Is it looking younger? If I get enough Botox, I may actually be happy because I'm back to my 25-year-old self. Is it relief from your back pain? Everybody, everybody, everybody said that. I was a physical therapist. I trust you. You fix people, and they're still unhappy. They still find themselves complaining about a new thing. Losing weight. Your child excelling at school. If your kid gets to Harvard, you are the happiest person alive, right? I, I'll tell you a story about a kid I know that on her graduation day, she graduated from law school, and she thought her, she was going to finally make her parents proud. And you know what happened on the day of their graduation? You know what her parents said to her? When are you going to get your MBA? <laughs> Knowing what you really want to do with your life, more supportive, loving parents, cure from a chronic illness or disability, more money or more time. So let me actually show you guys quickly this really cool graph. These are the factors that affect happiness. 50% of happiness is there's a genetic set point. So some people are more predisposed to negative emotions and chemical imbalances as a result of depression, anxiety, a variety of different factors. So some people, naturally, they have to fight that much harder to be happy. But that's only 50% of the equation. It can be, oh, I'm depressed, so I'm going to be unhappy. 50% of the equation. 40% of the equation is intentional activities. And 10% is just circumstances. So all those things that we said before are just 10% of what makes a person happy. Now, seriously, only 10%? Seriously, is that, I, I thought that if I got a new car, if I finally got that new house, if I finally got that increase in paycheck, if I finally got the things that I thought were going to make, make, make me happy, I would be good. You guys ever hear of the concept of the hedonic treadmill? The hedonic treadmill basically is every time you have a success or you reach a goal, you move the goalpost further. So I got that new car, I want a nicer car. I got it, I'm satisfied it for a short period of time, I'm looking for the next thing. I get the new house, I'm looking for the bigger car. I get the new relationship, eh, he's like kind of cool. I'm looking for the next relationship because it's going to make me better. Am I right or am I wrong? Am I right or am I wrong? How many of you really longed for something so bad in your life, you finally got it and you're like, ah, oh, I'm going to be good now. And before you know it, you're what? Vanity of vanities, right? King Solomon said it best. He said, I looked at my whole life and I saw all the riches and I saw all the things that I got and it was vanity of vanities, grasping for the wind. Perhaps this is the most counterintuitive thing that every single one of us seem to kind of subconsciously know, but we don't have the data and the science to back it up. But it only accounts for 10% of our happiness. So whether you're rich or you're poor, healthy or unhealthy, beautiful or just a plain ordinary gene, married or divorced, etc., it doesn't really matter. Those things are not what make you happy or unhappy. A great deal of science backs up this conclusion. For example, a well-known study demonstrated that the richest Americans that earn more than $10 million only had sig slightly significant levels of happiness than the janitors and the people that they employed. Only slightly, slightly a bit more happiness. Now you say, how is that possible? If any of you have traveled overseas to places like Egypt, or to places like Africa, or to places where people are living in extreme poverty. You know what I mean when you see people that have nothing and still are able to find happiness in everything that they do. Because it's not the material possessions and not the things that we have that make us more fulfilled and content. So what about the 40%? Thus the keys to happiness lies not in changing our genetic makeup, not in changing the circumstances, getting a new car, being more attractive, getting a job promotion. It's in daily intentional activities. 
I'm going to list those intentional activities that science has shown. And I'm going to say, I'm going to have you look at them, and I put next to them like what those practices are. But I want to take it deeper into what actually, how the church has already taught us for, for so long to us. So the happiest participants in studies, they found that they devote themselves, they devote a great amount of time to their family and their friends, nurturing and, en- nurturing and enjoying those relationships. So they invest in community. They are comfortable express- expressing gratitude for all that they have. We say the prayer of thanksgiving all the time. If only we were thankful, right? Being thankful. They are often the first to help They have helping hands to co-workers and passers-by, serving others. They practice optimism when imagining their futures, trusting and having a hope in God. They savor life's pleasures and try to live live in the present moment. They are fun people and they live in in, in the moment and not in the future. They make physical exercise a weekly and daily habit. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit? By the way, for us not taking care of our physical bodies and letting our physical bodies fall apart, this is not honoring what God has given us. It's not honoring it. So when you see, when you see that, like, it's important for priests to exercise, by the way, guys. Like, if you see a Buddha in the gym or something like that, you should be happy because he's taking care of his temple. It's not that, oh my God, haram, Abuna's exercising, oh my God, like, <laughs> No, you should say, good for Abuna, he's working out, like he's taking care of himself. Unfortunately, most Abunas have little gyms in their houses because they're scared of what you people are going to say about them. <laughs> I'm a rookie, so you guys, uh, I've set, I've, I'm going to set new precedents. No, I'm just kidding. I learned from those who came before me. I'm not getting in trouble, sorry. They are deeply committed to lifelong goals and ambition, fighting injustice, or teaching their children deeply held values vision and purpose, family life. Last but not least, the happiest people do have their share of stresses and crises. The rest of the slide says, but they find a way to choose joy in the midst of those circumstances. Let's go a little bit deeper into the science. There was a study of 724 men over 80 years. This is a Harvard study. 80 years. They followed these people from their childhood all the way through as they got older and wanted to see what contributed to their levels of of happiness some of those kids went to like really good schools some of them went to war at world war ii some of them were from the richest families and some of them were from the poorest families so the circumstances the 10 percent thing they took into account and they found after the 80 years that they studied these people the people who are socially connected to family and friends and to community are happier, they're physically healthy, and they live longer than people who are less connected. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the importance of the church. Community, being one body, looking out for the interests of others, caring for each other, not expecting that the only person that checks up on people within the church is Abuna, but actually looking out for each other actually calling people, actually investing in relationships, actually inviting people to dinner and making sure that they feel like they belong. 80 years they studied these men and they found that the people that often were the richest were often actually the people that were the most unhappy. And I've witnessed this in my own personal life. I've treated in my practice the richest of the rich people, the most powerful of the powerful people in Washington, D.C., they reach the heights of where a person can reach. And you sit them and you have them lay down on the table and you listen to their stories. And all of them feel a sense of emptiness because they've put so much of their value in only the 10%. So the three keys to happiness based on all the things that we just shared is gratitude, serving others, deep relationships, and community. Again, ladies and gentlemen, this is not rocket science. I didn't present to you a new innovative technique to find happiness and joy in life. This is what the church tells you to do. This is what scripture has revealed to us from the beginning of time. To be grateful, to have a sense of thanksgiving. And we'll go through this in detail in a second. But there are study 
after study. Okay, I can read them to, for you. Slatcher and Penbacker, 2006. Babak et al., 2017. Prayer, uh, Dweck, 2007. Lombersky, 2017. Ha study after study after study. And I'm all about research. Like having data to back up what you're saying. Gratitude, serving others, and deep relationships. You want to find fulfillment in life. It comes from these things, but it's rooted in what makes you have these things, what makes you intent and motivated to have those things, which is Christ. So it's, I can only be grateful when I recognize how much God has given me and blessed me with. I can only serve others when I know how much God has served me. I can only invest in deep and meaningful relationships because I know that the fundamental mission that God has called me to be is to love him and to love my neighbor. St. Anthony the Great says, I cannot imagine a man to be saved without his neighbor. So does this match biblically? A person can do nothing better than to eat and drink and find satisfaction in their own toil. This too, I see, is from the hand of God. For without him, who can eat or find enjoyment? Without him, who can eat or find enjoyment? I know that there's nothing better for people than to be happy and to do good while they live. They each of them may eat and drink and find satisfaction in all their toil. This is a gift of God. First John says, and we know that we pass from death to life because we love the brethren. There was a man all alone, and he had neither son nor brother. This is all from the book of Ecclesiastes, by the way, which I think is a fantastic book if you really want to understand the deeper searchings of the soul. There was a man all alone, he had neither son nor brother. There was no end to his toil, yet, all, yet his eyes were not content with his wealth. For whom am I toiling, he asked, and why am I depriving myself of enjoyment? This too is meaningless, a miserable business. Two are better than one, because if they have a good return for their labor, if either of them falls down, one can help the other up. But pity anyone who falls and has no one to help him up. Now, we've always taken this as to interpret it in terms of like marriage and stuff like that. But it's also talking about relationships, like relationships between one another, accountability, friends that look out for each other. When a community is going through a hardship or a family is going through a hardship, if they have another family that's looking out for them, they'll lift each other up and they'll encourage each other. So it matches biblically. I'm not making anything up. I'm not giving you some new self-help technique. I'm telling you what? King Solomon discovered in his life when he reached the highest point of life and he's gotten everything he possibly could ever wish or dream of. He looked at it and he said the words that all of us know. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. So does this match also liturgically? In our liturgical worship, we begin every prayer with the prayer of thanksgiving. There's literally no prayer. If we're praying for the sick, we pray, let us give thanks to the beneficent and merciful God the Father. If we pray the litany of the departed, let us give thanks to the beneficent God the Father. We always start with standing before God and giving him thanks for all things, concerning all things, and in all things. For he covered us, helped us, guarded us, accepted us to himself, spared us, supported us, and brought us to this hour. This is not just words. We, 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 we internally, when we are saying these prayers, we should actually pause and say, Lord, thank you for all the things that I have. I'm so blessed beyond measure. I got everything a person could ever want or dream or wish for. But somehow my perspective is flawed. Somehow I don't see all the things that you've blessed me with. We pray as a community of believers even when we are praying privately in our rooms. Even when you are praying in your room privately, you are not alone. We believe that we're surrounded by the multitudes of saints who pray with us. We believe that our prayers, that we pray for one another, carry us. So it's not just an individualized, like, that's why we say, <laughs> that's why when we pray, we always pray our Father, because there's a collective nature to it. It's not just my Father who is in heaven, it's our Father. He's our Father. He, I am nothing without you, and you are nothing without me. But somehow in the West, we've gotten this idea of individualism, me, 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 it's all about me, forget the next person next to me. Liturgy is the work of the people. 
That's what liturgeia, the Greek word, means. It means the work of the people. So we are, when we go and we receive the Eucharist, we are to go out in peace and to work. We say go in peace. What does go in peace mean? I've said this before. You probably heard me say it before. It's not peace out. It's not like see you guys later. It's not like. That's not what go in peace is. Go in peace is go, what, from what you've received, the peace. That's why we say, irani pasi, irani pasi, have peace, have peace. The peace that you've received from Christ, go and bring that peace to every single person that you encounter. Be an ambassador of peace. Be a person that when people encounter you, they walk away differently. We are to go into the serve, into the world and serve the world by bringing that same peace that we receive from Christ himself. The problem is, the problem is, the one who's filled can fill. The one who's empty has nothing to give. He gives of himself, and when he gives of himself, more than, more than, it's more common that that person actually harms others. I'm telling you, my brothers and sisters, it is of literally life and death that we invest in our relationships with God. I was at the college retreat yesterday and I took confessions for like eight hours straight. These kids are going through intense, intense war. We're not talking about like, this is not a joke anymore, ladies and gentlemen. This is not a joke, this is a war. If we aren't on our knees praying for our kids and our family and our community, begging God for grace, if we aren't living Bibles to our families and our kids, where is the future of the world? I said this to the grads on Thursday night, that the local church is the hope of the world. Our, ch we, our church is the hope of the world. If all of us rise up as a collective body, seeking power from on high and going out into the world, and transforming the world by the presence of Christ within us, we will see a different world. We will see it for sure. The problem is each of us say, ah, it's not a big deal if I pray. It's not a big deal if I come to church on Sunday. Oh, what? nobody even notices. No, <laughs> no, because we are individually members of one another. If one of us stumble, if one of us fall, if one of us struggle, we're all struggling. We've lost that mystery. So gratitude. How can we practice more gratitude in a world that makes us feel we always want and need more? There is a, a psychological approach that a lot of therapists recommend people to do is every morning when you wake up, get a little notepad and write down five gratitudes, five things that you're, ha you're grateful for. And over time, as you start to get in the practice of 21 days, they say, 21 days of practicing gratitude, 21 days of actually praying and thanking God for five things every single day, you'll start to notice that your perspective will change. Instead of noticing all the negative things that are going on around, you'll start to say, God is good. I feel good. Life is good. Like I have, I have so many blessings in my life. But you have to be intentional about it. It doesn't just happen. We have to renew our minds. St. Paul says it. Do not be conformed by this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. He also says, hold your thoughts captive literally hold them captive because our thoughts have a way of hindering us from being able to live a fulfilling life. The church fathers talk about thoughts all the time. And actually, as when Paul starts a series on the sayings of the desert fathers, I think that we're going to do one session exclusively on thoughts and the power of thoughts. So I would encourage you guys, if you really want to take this serious, if you want to live a more fulfilled, happy life, be intentional. Five things, right on your phone, maybe a notepad, Five, five things every single day that you're grateful for. And thank God for them. It's not like, oh, I'm grateful for my, like, my wife and my kids and like, I'm good, life is good. No, thank you God for my wife. Thank you God for my kids. Thank you God for the house that I have. Thank you God for the food that it's given me. Thank you God for my health. Thank you God for all these things. Thank you God for my sickness. Imagine how, how powerful of a prayer that is. Thank you God for the things that you give and the things that you take away. Thank you God for the good that I, you've given me, and also the things that I perceive as bad, knowing that you are a good God and nothing that is bad is actually bad because all things work together for good to those who love God. Serving others. How can you 
begin to incorporate a more selfless service to others more regularly. A series of studies show that people experience longer bursts of happiness when they receive an unexpected random act of kindness and remain uncertain about who did it and why. I'm going to tell you guys a story. My 25th birthday, a long time ago, my 25th birthday, I decided that I was going to take a group of my friends and we were going to do 25 random acts of kindness all throughout New York City. We were just going to do random nice things for people. It was the best birthday that I ever had in my life because we were just like randomly doing things all throughout New York City. I'll give you an example. We set up a hug station where people in the middle of New York City, they would walk by, hey, do you need a hug? And we just give people hugs. And you can't imagine how giving somebody a hug in a time where nobody wants to touch anyone. Maybe now during COVID times, nobody wants to give anyone a hug. But like during that time, you give somebody a hug and they're like, wow. And it's like we've lost the, the and I'm not telling you go out and randomly hug people. You'll, you'll, like, <laughs> I'm telling you. That. We had a sign that says, if you want a free hug, come give us a hug. But I'm, I'm not even talking about random acts of kindness. Like, we don't need to do random acts of kindness. We can do intentional acts of kindness in the church. Like, we have 10,000 people in this church, literally. Like, when I look at the lists of people that are in this church, I look at them like, how is it possible that four, four people can serve this whole community? Impossible. Impossible. Even if we never spent a minute of time with our families, it's impossible to serve all of you. So that's why we have to lean on each other and all of us serve together. It's not for just four men in black. Forgive me. I'm the new guy. I can say it. It's, you know, forgive me. I, I, I can't do it, and I promise you that I'm not going to do it. And you will criticize me all over your social media accounts and say, Abuna does nothing, but I promise you I'm doing what God is calling me to do. I promise you. I promise you I'm praying intently every single day for you all. I promise you that after the retreat on my whole car ride home, I was crying for all the youth that I sat with yesterday. Because if we lead on each other, if we support each other, if we actually start to build one another up, when we start to see that somebody's going through a hard time and I was part of the solution to their problem, I was part of the healing of their broken relationships. I was part of the healing of their families. I was part of the healing of the struggles. I visited them in the hospital. I looked out for them. We have a social support ministry in this church, but we don't have enough people. We don't, we don't have enough people serving. We have people coming, with all due respect, guys. I'm going I'm to say it. I'm going to say it like it is. Again, I'm the new guy. I can say things. Y'all are coming and you're expecting me to give you something new. You're expecting me to perform for you every Sunday. You're expecting me to share the word of God with you as if you've never heard it from the most saintly men before. You've heard it all. It's now time, freely as you've received, freely give. Freely as you've, as you've taken from the church, now be the church, be the ecclesia, be the work of the people that goes and says, oh, a Buddha never visited me. No, I don't need a Buddha to visit me. Believe me, I want to visit every single one of you. I promise you. But start visiting others. Start including people. Start looking out for people. When we serve others, we will truly feel a sense of joy, a sense of happiness. How can we be more intentional about building our community? Is by being intentional about it. It's a choice. It's a choice that every single one of us, every day, needs to make. Is I didn't see Mina at church today, I'm going to send them a text and say, hey, Mina, how are you? I'm looking out for you. I didn't see Sharif or Samah or whoever at church, Samah, Sharif, how are you doing? People feel like people desperately want to feel like people notice them. So many of these young kids said, Abuna, I feel lonely. I feel like nobody cares about me. I feel if I disappeared, nobody would even notice except my parents. How is that the truth, guys? How is that possible? We have 10,000 people in this church. How do people go unnoticed? You mean to tell me we can't look out for each other? You mean to tell me we can't exchange numbers? Forgive me, I'm sorry. Happiness is only found, truly only found, in a relationship with God, in a relationship with Christ, that anchors me and grounds me. And from that anchoring and grounding, I live a life of thanksgiving and gratitude. I'm motivated to serve others, and I'm encouraged to be a community that is a community of healing not a community of discouragement, not a community where people come in and they say, this community gossips about me. No, this is a community where I find life. That's my dream for the church. That's my dream for St. Mark's. 
And I know that that's the heart of God for St. Mark's. That he doesn't want St. Mark's to be a church with broken wings. He wants St. Mark's to be a church that's thriving, living with the heart of God, serving every single person and every single person, living according to what God has called them to live, to live a life more abundantly and to thrive. Glory be to God for every amen. Go in peace. <laughs> Let's stand up for a prayer. Not peace out. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen.